Previously on Manga Transdub Theater. Sometime after two in the morning, Suiko's husband came back dead drunk. He only offered a few excuses and reproved his wife. How dare you meddle on a man's affairs? Women aren't like men. We have to mix business with pleasure. Miss Suiko, no longer capable of bearing her husband's impertinence, ran off in a huff to the headquarters of the Women's League, where she was a member. The following morning, there were a number of ladies milling about the Women's League who understood acutely how men oppressed them, so Suiko found herself a rather sympathetic audience. At the end of the meeting, a motion was carried to go on a general strike, an act of sabotage that could convince their men to change their ways. Looking at the clock, Benzo realized there wasn't even 30 minutes before he needed to be at work. He needed his wife to hurry up and get breakfast ready. But she wouldn't even move. Benzo would just have to get the day started on his own. Thus hilarity ensues. The rice in the basin floated away, a grain at a time, much to the delight of a rat cowering in the drain. I bet the rats are absolutely loving this women's strike. As a mere junior official, Benzel was now responsible for providing tea service. Okay, editorial note here. So, Japan, like uh, most developed societies, is pretty sexist. And a lot of the more servile tasks in a Japanese office, unfortunately even today, were largely performed by women. So this is seen as, you know, incredibly degrading. The serving ladies every single one, had engineered their own act of sabotage, and the only person left to pour sake was the establishment's retired owner. <laughs> you know, if you really think about it, maybe we shouldn't drink at all. <laughs> the old man had to get his opinion out, as he barely managed to keep any booze in the cup. To make matters worse, the old man started hounding him for a tip just after a single pour, so Benzo hurried himself out of the establishment in quite a tizzy. A breeze blew in cold, such that Benzo couldn't sleep, and there was no one around to mend the hole in his futon for him. Oh, I suppose I'll just sleep with my head poking through. Benzo went to see his friend and was astonished at what he saw. The man of the house had spiked a feeder of over 40 degrees, centigrade that is, while his wife, tears welling up in her eyes, clenched her teeth and held fast to the strike order that the Women's League had decreed. Benzo couldn't fathom why she would persist like this in what seemed to be the man's last moments. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, for the thrilling conclusion of Okomoro Ippe's Onna no Taigyo, Women on Strike. I'm your host, translator, sound engineer, director, and proxy florist, Nicholas Tyson. In our previous episode, the long-suffering women of Taisho, Japan, finally took matters into their own hands and went on a general strike. Hijinks ensued, and where we last left, left off, Benzo's friend was receiving, eh, shall we say, some pretty rough treatment. We pick up back there with... Koibito no Taigyo, Lovers on Strike. As luck would have it, Benzo's friend gradually recovered from his illness. He remarked to Benzo, who'd come one day to visit, Everything around my bedside is so drab. Could you bring me some flowers? Even fake ones would be fine. Benzo went into town and found an artificial flower shop, but the women there too were sabotaging the business. A number of the men, so it seemed, had been given temporary employment as florists just to say they were scabs, <laughs> so all the flowers were rather crudely made. They'd haphazardly thrown together the petals of peonies, cherry blossoms, daffodils, pinks, and more, all into a single bloom. What's more, this floral monstrosity had maple and chrysanthemum leaves sprouting from the same lone branch. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, we see a university student named Benjiro, who just so happens to be Benzo's younger brother. He is of a fine character, makes good grades, and is completely smitten with the daughter of Inspector Tomiyogi, who works in the same office as Benzo. Our tale now turns to two other, though related, matters, as Benjiro is both to graduate in spring and is expected to be the groom at a lavish wedding. Today, he sits admiring a photograph of his beloved Tomie, which he has just retrieved from his desk drawer. 
This alone was not enough for him, though, so straightway he began to compose a love letter. I am but a savage before a goddess. Would that I might call you my wife this very moment, for I intend to dedicate my whole life to you. Having written more than enough, Benjudo rushed off to post the letter. Benjudo spent all his time pining for a response, craning his neck out the window, but Tomie never wrote him back. She, too, was engaged in the strike that the Women's League had organized, and before her set a mound of unopened letters. When no response came, Benjudo kept pouring out his heart in desperation, grew ever more impatient, and the mailbox swelled with all the missives he jammed into it. His fiancée, Tomie, meanwhile was being buried beneath a mountain of letters. Finally, Benjudo became fed up with the lack of a response, and so he endeavored to see her in person. But it was already quite late in the evening, so by the time he knocked at the front door, the entire Tomiyogi household were fast asleep. Benjudo crawled up through a loose floorboard in the kitchen. Uh and tried heading into Tomie's be bedroom. Uh, but alas, no matter what he tried, she would not receive him. Oh, okay, so for those of you who are thinking that this is getting a little weird, you have to understand that sort of seduction narratives in classical Japanese literature are very rapey in general. Um, you'll, you'll see a spider hanging from... Benjudo's nose there, that's sort of an allusion to a classical lover's trope. I don't want to get into it. Please don't make me get into it. Benjudo had torn his sleeve getting in, and he recalled wistfully how his love would mend things for him. It made no difference when he stood right in front of her and said, Look here! While holding out the sleeve he'd mangled, she just wouldn't budge. He also recalled how she would wipe away the ink smudges on his face with her silk handkerchief. So Benjudo smeared black, black ink all over his face and dangled it over her nose. Again, you'll notice the spider. Tomie shed a flood of tears, but would not relent. Benjudo seemed to have exhausted all his options, and his lover's non-reception made him think she'd had a change of heart. The only choice left to him, or so he thought, was to commit suicide. But when Benjudo undid his collar and headed toward the pines along the embankment... Okay, I'll hold up for a second. So this is probably, at least I'm guessing, it's an allusion to a famous like double suicide lover's trope. Um, again, I'm not going to get into it. You can read um, Sonazaki Shinju, the double suicide at Sonazaki, yourself. I just don't, I just don't want to get into it. <laughs> anyway... Continuing, a whole host of lovers, undone by the strike, had beat him to the punch and were already hustling to leave the floating world behind them. String me up first! No, I must be the first to go! They cried out as they grappled with one another. While Benjudo headed home along the embankment, his collar still undone, at a complete loss for what to do, Someone came to call upon his old brother, Benzol. It was his senpai from where he grew up, old man Matsuo, who was blue in the face as he let out a sigh and launched straight into a non-stop, one-way conversation. The old man had but a single daughter, an extraordinary beauty, who had received a number of marriage proposals, and it seems the son of Mr. Tomiyogi, the director of a certain firm and father to Benjiro's lover, Tomie, had won out over the others. Their father considered the, ma beat the match to be quite a good one, and believed in it so fervently that he had demanded a penalty of a million yen if the wedding were to be called off. <laughs> so as you can imagine, old man Matsuo was not at all keen on cancelling the wedding, and thus preparations went forward. But on the morning of the day his daughter was to be wed, the Women's League sent out their call for a general strike. All of a sudden, his daughter was adamant. "'I will never be a bride!' Not to Tomiyogi-san, not to anyone in the whole world! Benzo went with old man Matsuo to see the elder Tomiyogi. 
From its inception, the Tomiyogi clan was a family of some prestige, and its ancestors, so it's been said, flourished and prospered by always keeping their word. Matsuo amused to himself. Maybe I could give my daughter the boot and find a substitute to offer up as sacrifice so that Tomiyogi doesn't have to lose face. Word of our promise has likely already reached a million years, and if we can't figure this out... Naturally, old man Matsuo couldn't be expected to pay the million yen penalty, but with the women's strike still ongoing, there wasn't even a female cat to be found that they could offer up in his daughter's stead. That's when Benzo had an idea. His younger brother Benjiro had been wandering about the area, and they could offer him up as a sacrificial lamb. I think we're saved, old man! Generally speaking, wedding preparations were made by the servants, so the two men ended up making Benjiro look something worse than a monkey in a carnival show. There's really nothing that corresponds to that image, it's weird. Before the altar of the great shrine, where Benjiro had been hijacked into exchanging nuptials, he snatched the sake bottle from the bemused matchmaker and drank the whole thing out of desperation. Thenceforth, our bride attended her reception banquet at the Imperial Hotel, where the guests were all complaining loudly about the loneliness they've suffered since the onset of the women's strike. Those in attendance, even while they were attending to the couple, actually had to look after their own children. The women's strike had forced them to take up the responsibility all for themselves. They were even changing diapers in the midst of the festivities. All this and more brought the men of Japan to a point of crisis. They were in a panic over the power women held over them, so they decided to convene a meeting of their own. The men of the convention took a drunk gentleman hostage and pressed him into pleading with the Women's League to tell him what the underlying cause of their strike was. The women all gave him a knowing look and just smiled. And shortly thereafter, Benzo and his wife, Benjiro and Tomie, and the newly married Tomiyogis all spent a lovely day out wandering among the rows of irises. And scene. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you really like this video, you can support my work on Patreon. That's at www.patreon.com forward slash it came from the manga, all one word. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter, links for which can be found in the description below. And I'll be back next week with another episode of Manga Transdub Theater. But until then, don't let the men get you down. Bye. Thank you.